Hi, my name is John Gabriel. I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. I'm interviewing Clifford Apgar today on January 10th, 2007 at the main library. Our camera operator today is Dennis Daly. Welcome, Mr. Apgar. Thank you. Let's start off with a little background. Where did you grow up? In Hamilton, Ohio. Hamilton, Ohio. Born and raised and lived there so far 91 years. Wow. Wow. What were you doing prior to the war? Well, I was working for the Champion Paper and Filing Company. Uh, well, when I started out, I was practically in a whole mill, just doing different jobs. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to be a machinist. So I had to threaten to quit to get, to get the job. <laughs> they put me off for about six weeks, and finally they said, well, if you're going to leave, we'll offer you two jobs. One was an electrician, one was a machinist. Is that where you were working when you heard the, uh, about the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor? Uh, no, I, well, I was working there, yeah, but I wasn't in the machine shop yet. But uh, I was working on the riverside of the thing, and I, well, it was nighttime. When I came out, Bobby met me or somebody met me and told me right away when I came out the door. I see. Is that did you did you enlist right away? No, I didn't enlist. I was drafted. You were drafted. Where did you uh, where did you end up? Or how, how how soon after you were drafted did you leave for for a training and, and where was the training? Uh, well, uh, after I was drafted, it wasn't too long. I went down to Fort Knox and I uh, took my basic training down there. And then uh, after the training was over, they gave us the test for the OCS, and a few of us passed, and, but they didn't have any schools open at the time. Hmm. So they gave us a choice of either going with the company or staying there and doing the specialized training for different uh, things in the armed force. So whoever passed, we stayed. And, uh, I took gun mechanics training, and when that was over, the uh, uh, said, "Well, there was still no chance of getting into a school, hmm. so we had to go home." That was Christmas time. What what year was this? Forty three. Forty three. Yeah. So they let us go home for Christmas, and we had to go to Fort Meade, and when we got to Fort Meade. They never had a call for a gun mechanic to go overseas till the 4th Battalion of you know, was from Fort Knox came up there. I was in the 4th Battalion I left with them. They had to go to England. And, uh, we left uh, on the uh, 11th of May on uh, Morton Bay. A little freighter that belonged to England, hmm. and uh, they sent us out, no convoy, no nothing, just by the boat itself. We went across the North Atlantic, took us 11 or 12 days to go across, and we went into several storms with 40 and 50 foot waves. And they gave us hammocks. The little boat was uh, used to take. Uh, carcasses of cows and stuff. They hung on these hooks, so we hung the hammocks on them. <laughs> and we was right up in the bow of the boat, and uh, when you get those 40 and 50, 50 foot waves, you didn't go through them, you went rode with them. Oh boy. And you talk about sick dogs. <laughs> no doubt. But I didn't, I didn't get sick. I couldn't eat, but they, uh, every day the cook baked bread every day and, and you could smell it all over the ship and uh, I got so well I could stand the bread and a little butter and jelly and uh, milk or water and I could keep that down <laughs> but other than that it was, then we landed over in Liverpool okay and we left uh, Liverpool on board a train right away as soon as we got off. 
but down from there, down to the south, down to Frodo. And uh, we got to Frodo, they put us on two and a half ton trucks, took us out to a big estate, uh, uh, Marston on Bicket, was called. Some uh, big shelter had it, and there was a lot of acreage. And there were thousands of troops around there. Hmm. So we was stationed there until, well, they did some training there, had you do some running and exercises and stuff like that. But then the uh, 22nd of uh, June, they put us on board these two and a half ton trucks and took us down to Southampton and put us on board the LST and went across. Well, that was right after the big storm came up and wrecked all of their uh, stunted ships and everything that they'd done over there. Over in the Normandy area? Yeah, Omaha Beach. And uh, when we got into the supposed to be harbor there, when I, uh, they anchored outside, they brought LCIs in, and uh, we had to go down a rope ladder with our gear and everything. And, dropped into that LCI and then they took us into the shore and uh, when they got there well, they said well now there's only one way to go and they pointed to the hillside there and he said there's a trail up the cliff there and you go up that and you got two man pup tents you go up on top of there and find the place you want to locate set your pup tent up and just Relax, that uh, we won't get to you for two or three weeks. He said, We'll get back with you. We'll put food out some places and water, and you just go and get that and wait till we get to you again. So we uh, did that and uh, never had any call for my MOs, and so I was staying. At this the, point, you're, you've been trying to do exactly what? Well, uh, just uh, stay alive. We, uh, they had stupid dive bombers came over every night, and uh, they had barrage balloons on the ships and stuff out that were out there, so they couldn't come into that area. So they just come in high and dove down over our area, and you could lay there and see the fire coming out of their exhaust and stuff, you know. But they didn't drop any bombs hmm. right away. I guess they had orders to drop them before they went back home, but uh, they did uh, drop them. They might even get some of their own people with them, because they just dropped them anywhere. We had a uh, well, a bunch of uh, colored men. Uh, they drove all the trucks and stuff over there, and they had uh, tankers with the fuel in them. They probably had parked further away towards the front than we were. And they crawled out and got underneath hmm. the trucks, and one of the bombs happened to hit right in the middle, and of course, a big ball of fire and everything came up. And so we all started running over there, and then the MPs got there before we did. So they stopped us and said if we had any uh, bandage packing or anything like that to leave in a certain place that we want back to where mm -hmm. we came from. Then we got back there, and uh, one of the guys called into his tent, and he come running out, screaming. Uh, when the bomb went off, and it uh, um, threw up big chunks of ground, earth, and it uh, made it real hard. It came down through the tent and mashed his buddy's head. No kidding. And, uh, he was all shook up <laughs> when he went in there. And he didn't see the holes at the hip at first. And, but, uh, and we, well, some of that, I got the different times we went through as we followed the troops along until we got to, to uh, uh, September the 1st. We finally decided that uh, my ammo didn't beat anything anymore. So we had called for more just uh, tankers. Okay. So I was set up for the third armored uh, 
first of September. Nineteen forty four. Okay. I'm sorry you want me to go. Well, here's what I want to know. Uh, did they give you any training uh, as a as a tanker or did they just send you right up into the Well down to Fort Knox. Okay. They, yeah. Okay. I mean you well, I could drive a tank. Uh, my driver's license was tank, half track, Jeep, and a two and a half ton truck. I had a license for all of those. Interesting. So when they did they assign you a tank immediately? Uh, you mean when I went to the third armor? Yes. Yeah. But uh, see, they they had been through France, and they were kind of getting kind of uh, worn out. Mm -hmm. That way, it, uh, they were getting short on them and stuff. And we had just gone into the Belgium, and they had these uh, tank uh, traps like I don't know, a pillar of cement that scattered all over it, and they had bunkers behind them. And uh, of course, we couldn't get through the tank traps and the uh, infantry. We didn't want to try them to get those bad rear uh, explosives to put into there. So uh, we pulled back. And uh, they called up our TDs, the tank destroyers. They had a bigger gun than we had. Mm -hmm. But we sat there and shot at the bunkers and tried to hit the, the building holes to put us at HE in the, in the lab. But uh, that's kind of hard to do if you if you don't. Well, I don't, have you ever shot a gun like that? Or, no, no. Well, uh, after. I got done with that. Anytime I got into a new tank, I always bore sighted it myself to make sure that I, what I was shooting at is what I was going to hit. What kind of tank were you in at this point? M4. Sherman tank? Sherman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, light tank. So I had a brother in law that was in a light tank. But, uh, Did you spend your whole career in the Sherman? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Always the same type. I mean, it had a right cyclone motor in it. Mm -hmm. And it's 476 horsepower, used high octane fuel, 90 octane, and you had a sponsor on each side that carried 100 gallon in each one. It was on each side of it. Hmm. And you carried uh, 100 rounds of ammunition. Some of them were stored underneath you, and some of them around you in holders. And uh, 60 some rounds of High explosive and uh, 30 rounds of armor piercing, and then you had magnesium shells. What are those? Well, uh, spread fire. Okay. And, uh, you see these guys, uh, these flamethrowers and stuff? Yeah. You know, something like that. The shell was, would explode and be a big ball of fire. I see. How many, how many members in the tank were? Five. Five? Three in the turret and two driver and assistant driver at the bottom. I see. There's a motor, got a gunner, and a tank man. And what was, did you did you start out being a driver then? No, I started out being a, I never went down to the driver. I was a loader, a gunner, and a tank commander. Okay. And then, the, of course, I had the five tanks after, when, I, when it was all over. You've been in five different tanks? No, I was in charge of five tanks. Oh, I see. I see. Well, let's get back to September of 44. You're in the tank. Is this your first taste of combat? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, uh, on the, it was at the Belgian border between France and, and Belgium, is that right? Yeah. Did you make it through there eventually with no problem? Once we got those uh, tank barriers and the bunkers out, which the tank destroyers with their big gun could do. I mean, they could pen penetrate the bunkers. So we, I don't know, it took us several days or a week to get those done. But then we didn't have much trouble going to Belgium then. I mean, I guess they were delay a delayed action for the Germans to leave. And, uh, we got down to uh, oh, into Germany, 
and that uh, was Stolberg. Uh -huh. We went up to that uh, mountain, small mountain, or big hill, or whatever it was, and we went up and made the people get out of the, some of the buildings up there and uh, moved in. How deeply into Germany are you at this point? Uh, not too far. Well, we came through Aachen. If you didn't fight Aachen, though? No. Okay. No. Uh, there was some uh, paratroopers there. I don't know if it was either first or age second, I don't know which one it was. But they were there. And uh, while we were in this area around Stolberg, we, uh, well, they sent us to Aachen several times to see if they needed help or anything. And the Hurtin Forest was down from us. And we went down there several times, but uh, we couldn't get through it. I mean, there was no roads or anything like it through it. Just pass, and uh, the trees kept us from going through it. So, uh, we, I think we went down there twice. And then, uh, you know, oh, uh, one time, uh, they wanted to probe the defenses past Alcum. So they sent our company through and we went down. They, uh, that was where they could control the, the flow of the water in some of their streams and stuff. They could let water out and uh, spread it out into low areas. But, uh, we went there and there was a low area for the where they could flood it if they had or wanted to. And then there was a, a high, big area over on the left in the back of us. And there was a road going from the slow area up to the high area. Well, uh, they were suspicious of going using that road to get up to the high area. So they sent us in on the low area. And uh, we were the lead tank at the time. And when we got so far in, we ran over a mine. Mm. And it threw our right track off and wound it up around the sprocket in the front. So we got out and uh, uh, nobody was hurt. And uh, we walked around and everything. And uh, once in a while we'd hear a ping. And you see a little splat of lead against our tank. People were shooting at us. <laughs> <laughs> nobody was ever hit. And uh, uh, to our left up uh, in the field there, the guy was screaming his head off. He was, uh, I don't know, he was in pain. He it was some uh, three or four football fields away from us. So uh, a buddy of mine and we decided to go and see what was the matter. Uh, we went over and told there was two men there. And when he got close enough that we could hear him, he was hollering, stop, stop, don't come any further. And we stopped, and then he started telling us that there was uh, individual lines for uh, individual people all around through there. Oh, my gosh. And uh, come to find out, this guy that was screaming, he had his leg blown off. And this, well, there was a medic trying to help him. So he asked us if we had any medical equipment and stuff with us, and we had the packs and stuff, and said to throw them to him. Well, we were able to throw him a couple of them. And he said, now, he says, when you go back, just step in the same steps you come over. <laughs> so we did, got back all right. But then uh, the next day, uh, they sent a Tech store, or uh, uh, what do they call them, Neptunes? A retriever, tank retriever, up to take our tank. And uh, Lieutenant in charge, he got hooked up and everything, and he wanted uh, the driver to get in and, uh, and help him pull it out. Uh, he wouldn't do it. He just came back from being, I don't know, shot or whatever. He wouldn't get in the tank anymore. So we had the assistant driver get in. Well, that was a wrong mistake. And we started up the engine and they 
started a pole and he put it in gear and left the clutch out and that um, spun the sprocket on the right where the was wild around the sprocket. I uh, slammed it down into the ground and there was more mines underneath there and just set it off and blew, blew the tank up again, set it on fire. And I jumped up on the back and the time I got up there, the flames just come out of the truck. I'll be done. Uh, I had going off and everything, so I got off in a hurry. But, uh, I don't know what. Uh, the next day, uh, our guy that uh, took care of the statistics in the service or in the company, he came up. He said the guy was blown from the driver's side over into the, in the hills where he used to be. He was just going did long before he ever knew it, I guess. It's a big mine then that hit that, that, yeah. that hit. Yeah. There must have been two or more mines underneath that it set it off. Wow. Yeah. How long well, until you were uh, given a new tank? Oh, right away. I mean, that, that's one thing they could do. They could supply you with tanks. That's you know, it was, uh, amazing. They uh, take it back. So it was just a shell in the hole in it while they just roll the big plane on it and then fix it up and make sure everything around it worked. Hmm. Or, or mine's a big danger then. Yeah. Frequent, you, know, you frequently ran into that scene? Well, not too much. I mean, uh, uh, at the beginning there where they had borders and stuff, they didn't have stuff like that around. It. But, uh, but we, well, we came back then and they found out that they were pretty well hooked. Uh, fortified around here. This is in Stolberg again? Yeah. Okay. So we went back to those Stolberg and then, uh, well, we, uh, well, we had those pictures I showed you where they had indirect fire when we were shooting into Hurtin Forest. Hmm. Um, that was our company that was in those pictures. And you could see the shells all around them, but we had fired them hundreds of rounds so in the Hurtin Forest. And they were sent into a pattern five tanks, then five tanks, then five tanks and back and with a pattern shot. He just used the longitude and latitude to, to fire into the hooking forest. Hmm. And you move it around a little bit, but that's the, the pattern fire would be the same all the time. Interesting. But I don't whether they did any good or not, I don't know. Nobody's ever said. Did you did you encounter any return fire from the Germans? Uh we had kind of mortar fire, but uh, there was only one that was effective. We had a TD in back of us there, and uh, one mortar fire went right into the, that. They had open turrets and the, and the TDs, and that one mortar shot away right in the turret. I'll be done. Killed a whole bunch in there. But then uh, we had these uh, buzz bombs over. Every night. Hmm. And uh, well, you could hear it like a motorcycle going over. And uh, whenever that cut off, the bomb was going down. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were standing more over toward England at the time. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And where did you move after Stolberg? Uh, we went back to the Balls Turn. Oh, my sake. 18th of December, we went back, we started back. And 16th, I think, we started their invasion again. Tell us about, tell us about your unit's combat in the, uh, the Ardennes. Well, uh, we went back and we got, see, we were on the other end of the boat. We was on the German side. And we went back to, uh, ever hear of Malmody? Yes. Well, we went back there. And uh, when we got to the border there, they told us that uh, Malady and uh, Manhay, there was a road that goes to it. And we were supposed to go down that road, clear out anything that came up, and get to Manhay, and which we did. We did, well, at that end, there wasn't a whole lot of resistance. I mean, the resistance was all on the other end of the boat. That's where 
Paderborn, took a square bit of the square of Paderborn, where uh, that one town that they stayed in, that General did, and said that's the way. Oh, that's done. Yeah, yeah. Well, we weren't anywhere near that. But we did uh, clear out the road to Manhattan. And we got there the 24th of December. And uh, when we got there, we were supposed to relieve, uh, uh, I think it was the 4th Armored Division, one of the patents out of it. And uh, we got to Man uh, Manhattan, and the MPs and the engineers were there. So they told us we'd have to get off of the road to let the, the force armor come through. Well, we got off the road and, and Pete came up to our tank and he said, now you're going to have to get off, further off the road. He said, they won't be able to get through. So we pulled off and we bottomed out. <laughs> we just couldn't move. The tanks were just taking their turn. So they came through and uh, so the rest of the company went up to where they were supposed to be, and we were sitting there in the back doing nothing. And, but uh, our company, when it got up there, after a while, they got surrounded and had uh, you know, damaged all their tanks and everything that they had, and put it back to good area. Okay. But uh, in the meantime, we. Uh, we decided that three of, three of us to go over and find a place where we could get warm and everything and uh, leave the two at the table. So we went in, found a farmer, and had a fire going and everything, and started warming up. And here the two that we left came running back. And you're going to have to come up here since uh, the Germans are coming in the other end of the town. And he said the MPs are pulling out and the engineers are pulling up their lines and leaving. We went up and decided, well, we'd take the firing pins out of the guns and everything and then leave it. When we got there, the tank came in the other end of the road and he saw us and threw one at us and got right in front of the tank. We oh, oh. started to get up on it and it changed our mind. <laughs> we got down and started going out the other end and we got to, oh, I don't know. There was a road coming into Van Hay, and then there was one going off up a hill, some other direction, I don't know. And here's an aircraft artillery, or, yeah, artillery outfit coming down this road and going up the hill. Well, we were just able to catch the last time the aircraft gun and <laughs> jump on it. We got on, went with them, and that was the 24th, that was New Year, or Christmas Eve. Well, we went with them until they stopped in the town, I don't know, it was 10, 15 miles away. And uh, we went up and uh, got to the captain that was in charge and told him that uh, we were from Third Armour and everything. Oh, let's back up just a little bit. Okay. Uh, when we left the Stolberg and everything, our command was changed to Montgomery's, the mm -hmm. English command. We were under his command until we got to Van Hay, and we were switched back to the Third Armor then. Who commanded that? The uh, Third Armor Rose. He okay. was the one that was killed in the action. Okay. The only general was killed in the action. Okay. But uh, now we're about there. Also, we were going into this town with the uh, anti aircraft guns. Well, they invited us to stay for Christmas. We did. And, uh, he said, well, they get us back to our outfit the next day. And, uh, he took us back to the area where they were uh, taking all the lost people, I guess, and getting them back to their outfit. So uh, we did. And finally got back and got another tank. It was always ready to have that tank. <laughs> We, was that the first time getting back to that uh, German tank? That the first time a, a German tank had fired at you? Mm -hmm. No. I don't think so. 
Well, it might have been then. There was another time that we uh, were going out on the assault and we come to this one big area where uh, there was a tiger tank sitting down in the field. And uh, it was, I don't know whether they couldn't move or what, but the, their gun was aimed up to the road that we were supposed to go across. But it wouldn't move the gun, they just let it sit there and uh, would fire in one position on that road. Huh. So, there again, we were the first tank. <laughs> We went across, and uh, of course you could vary your speed and try to, they'd have to judge where you were, and where the shell would get, and everything. Well, they just missed us right behind the turret of our tank, but we had five infantry guys on the back. The shell got, well, it was a horrible person shell, but they got killed too, and knocked the other three off, well, knocked all of them off. We got through, and uh, I think uh, most of the company got through all right. They didn't uh, get to hit anybody. No one, bought, no one fired back at the uh, tiger? Oh, no. You, you could never know the use. No use. You know, the tigers and the panthers, you, know, you just mess with them. Wow. But uh, if we had our TDs with us, we, they had the better gun. And, uh, Time we didn't have any. How big was the gun on the Sherman? 76. Well, it started out with a 75, a short barrel 75, then we went to a 76, but the high powered 76. And none of those were useful against the. Not, not the Tiger or the Panther, no. What about the, the tank destroyer? How big was it? Well, they had a 90 mm. I see. And that was always effective or somewhat effective? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good. So you didn't mix it up too often with German armor. You you more were you more apt to fight against German infantry? Well, uh, you fought whenever the time came. I mean, uh, if if there was armor ahead of us, you had to do something. Yeah. And you, you couldn't just sit back and say, "Well, go ahead, <laughs> somebody else." Uh, didn't work. Right, right. Uh, but, uh, no, we went uh, into a town one time and uh, there was a cemetery, or as I recall, on one side, an open area on the other. And we went into the town, it was narrow road, and we went uh, into it. Somebody shot a panther, panther fast at us. And this landed right underneath the tank and we sat there and rocked back in my baby carriage for a few minutes or so. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, we backed up a little bit. And then a major came up and he ordered the tank commander to go on in. He said, I'm not going in. He, he, he told him, he said, I'm not going in there. He, didn't take the command, which the guy could have shot him, I guess, a major, but uh, in the meantime, he got shot himself. No, so he picked him off the page. Oh, no. He didn't kill him, but uh, his driver picked him, got him up and put him in the Jeep, and they went back, and so we just sat there, and, and uh, I noticed, I was a gunner at the time, and I noticed uh, there was Germans in uh, foxholes all over on that clear side there. And uh, I shot my 30 caliber at them until it froze. Huh. So I took it out and had a 30 caliber down the system driver's seat. And we exchanged 30 calibers there. So I fired it until it froze. So then I started eating 76s at them. <laughs> And they're firing back at you all the time. I well, guess. with their rifles. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but uh, uh, they'd, uh, I could, I had a board side of my right, uh, 76, so I knew where I was shooting. 
and they had dirt around their holes. Well, I could hit those holes or those dirt piles. And that, I don't know whether it would threw the shell particles back down in them or what. But one time, a German jumped up and waving a white flag, <laughs> he ran over and jumped in the tunnel. Then uh, they sent a different, different company into the cemetery plot on the left. And uh, it, I think it was I company. I was in each company. And uh, this friend of mine, he was in there. And they started shooting at them. In these panzer house. And uh, they jumped out, the buddy of mine, or friend of mine, and they jumped out and was going back to the back, and uh, one of these panzer fouls went right in front of the tank, and the blast went back underneath towards them, and tore his whole calf of his leg off. Mm. And he just barely got back time to get his life saved. But, wow. Wow. He was Charlie White. He lived down in Paris, Kentucky. And we, well, we got back uh, when we left Bantry, we were showed another road that we went to Hoofalize. Hmm. And we said we go there that way. Well, that was when it was starting to snow and get uh, deep. We got, uh, well, we were knee high from the snow, cold, 10 degrees, 10 below to degrees below zero. Oh, boy. But uh, it's that uniform that I had in that picture, that's what I wore during the bulge. That didn't look like the warmest uniform. Well, it was an aviator's jacket and a hat an aviator with the earmuffs. And uh, that kept me warm. Well, all wool clothes, of course, and well, one of the cotton. But, uh, yeah. That's all I had. Oh. All I went through, it didn't bother me a bit. Yeah. Infantry guys come up and wanted to get in the tank and get warm. <laughs> that was colder in there. Well, the only thing you got away from was the wind. You, you, well, just like getting into a refrigerator or a freezer or something in there. Oh, wow. And it was cold. Then, uh, well, every evening we'd pull together and, uh, well, play cowboy and Indian. We'd get into the circle protect ourselves, but then we were supposed to have had infantry guys, uh, well, paratroopers, to be our outer guard. Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to come up to us and set up their perimeter. And one time, they didn't show up. So, uh, the lieutenant came up to the tanks and said, well, I need four helpers. He said, uh, you, you, and you. <laughs> that was one of you. And I only carried the 45. And, uh, he said, we have to have something more than that. And, uh, he looked up at one of the guys in the turret. He said, how about some weapons? The guy pulled out a Thompson submachine gun. <laughs> and went down to me. He had three clips, two pointed up one way, one the other with tape, tape together, you know, so yeah. they could find themselves. <laughs> Well, he said, well, let's go. So we let him go first because he made this trail to that knee high snow. Oh, no. You know, we went to uh, four or five football fields ahead. And, uh, we heard somebody talking. And we couldn't make out whether it was German or English. And we walked a little further and uh, the, uh, there was a clearing there, and uh, you could still hear the talking, and we got to the edge of the clearing, you could see the people there, we still didn't know who we were. So the lieutenant said, well, he said, you spread out, he said, give me some protection. He said, I'll go out and see who they are. He didn't, but well, it turned out that they were uh, the infantry, or the paratroopers, the ones holding the gardens. And we came back. Uh, we, well, the Germans were leaving, man. I mean, you didn't get much.
much resistance. But we did come to one place where a tiger tank was sitting in back of a little uh, raised area in the road. Mm. And uh, he wouldn't do anything but come up to the top of a hill, rise in the hill there and let us shoot at him. He, he wouldn't shoot back or anything. <laughs> and uh, he did that three or four times. And uh, then one, after a while, he never showed up. So we didn't know what was going on. So we, we figured that uh, he had just put up a resistance so the Germans could escape. Uh, he finally got up nerve enough to go up and uh, and see, and here they just left the tank set there. And they huh. Left too. Was it still operable? Did you get in? Uh, it. Uh, they were out of fuel almost. I guess is the reason they just pulled up and went back. And, but the gun was still usable. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. We never got in to see if they took the firing pin out or not. They might have done that. Now you mentioned. Uh, beforehand, that uh, you were involved in an ambush. That... Well, that's when we got up to Paddleboard. Okay. Uh, we got back, well, when we got to Hoofa Lines, that was as far as we were supposed to go, that was in January. So we went back to uh, Stolberg, same area and everything, until they uh, got all re equipped and everything. And then they, we started our uh, assault on the uh, First uh, place we uh, were supposed to take was the Earth Canal. It was, but uh, they uh, wouldn't let us go in the daytime. They made an assault at midnight. They spread us out and uh, told us that the canal was up that way. Midnight, it was dark, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. <laughs> he said, just spread out, okay, make any difference what you run over, the cows, people, or whatever, he said, just go. Are you without infantry protection? No, <laughs> we don't, never did have infantry protection, other than we carried it with us. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, I don't know, we were in Germany by ourselves all the time. Wow. We, they'd, uh, they'd radio us what fuel and uh, food we needed. And we had uh, set a place where we could come back and pick it up and, and go. We never had any protection like that. We had our food with us. We raided uh, Germ German farmers of potatoes and eggs. And uh, when we went back for our food, the boxes, well, there were 10 and 1 rations. And they, wooden boxes, and they marked on the outside what was in them. Well, everybody had head for them first, and the ones that could get to it, they wanted the bacon. Uh -huh. and, you know, which could have fried bacon and potatoes and eggs for breakfast. <laughs> Sounds good. But anyway, uh, we've gone to the Earth Canal, and we started out, and uh, I don't know how far we went, and all of a sudden the bottom fell out of the tank. We just went down like that and stopped. We got out and felt around and decided we had dropped into a hole. 30 foot across, about 20 foot deep, just enough to put a tank in. It was a bomb crater, I guess. Well, there was one, uh, oh, it was two, two foot wide, I guess. There was another one, the same, same thing on the side. <laughs> well, nobody was hurt. Well, I did hurt. One short, I got rotator cuff problems. But I mean, I could still do all my work and everything in it, so it didn't make any difference. But uh, we waited till the next day, and uh, we were just wandering around the hole and seeing what it was like and everything. You know. Somebody saw us, and he dropped a motor around, but they dropped into the hole next to us. Wow. That's the only one they fired at us. Huh. We come back, picked us up with a two and a half ton truck, took us up to the earth canal. When we were going up there, uh, 
tank commander at the time, who was an avid deer hunter. And he saw some deer coming out of the forest off to our right. When we got up to work, now we didn't have enough to do or anything, so he wasn't going to know if anybody wanted to kill deer hunting. Well, I'd go with him. All we had were 45s. <laughs> so we got up to the edge of the forest and uh, he started in and he held his hand up. He pointed and there was a deer. Well, I don't know how far away it was, but that white tail was just a flopping away. He said before, he said now, he says, I want the first shot. He said, after that, he said, I don't care who you shoot at. <laughs> he did. He got fired. He skinned the thing jumped about 10 foot in the air and come down, took him. <laughs> I said, You missed it. <laughs> I said, No, I didn't. He did come up here. He went up to where he was standing, big pool of blood. Wow. And the trail go away. And we went over and finally found it and it was dead. And we made an extra hole in the back end of it. And, uh, he, all he wanted was the ear off. He wanted to cut the ear off and take it back and send it home. <laughs> Showing he'd been near him. But we went up, and you know, he started getting his knife and stuff out in here. A bunch of men surrounded us. We backed up. And we had about 16 shells between us to protect ourselves, but they didn't want us. They wanted the deer. No kidding. They were DPs. Oh. oh. But uh, we couldn't. Communicate. You know, he boasted for his ear and pointed at the deer and the knife and cut it off. They understood and they went and got the ear and gave it to him. And all he wanted to do was a deer and to eat with it. Wow. But, uh, yeah, well, you were you were on your way to Paderborn, I guess. Uh, not yet. Get my notes. So far, they had to aim the tag almost to 
picture. So it was going out across our front, and uh, well, both tanks saw it at the same time, I guess, and they both fired at it at the same time. And it hit it, both of them, and one of them hit it and set it on fire. But we saw two guys get out, and one was dragging the other one, went over, dragged him over to the house there. Well, uh, my tank avenger decided to go up and, and see what was going on. So we got up where the other tank went, we never did find out. But we got up and went through the village. And uh, when we got through the village, nobody didn't see anybody. We saw the guy dragging the other one into the house as we went by. But uh, other than that, no people at all. We went through the village. The tax man to get out and he went up to the, to the banks of the Ryan River. And he came back. Oh, they got a good chance here, he said. There was big flat bottom boats going across taking the soldiers, German soldiers, back over to the other side. Well, he decided we'd turn that tank and bring it up to the bank of the river and blast the sure. flat bottom boats. It was a good idea at the time. Uh -huh. But if you made a left turn and broadside of the road, and there was a tank gun sitting out, or not a tank, uh, a big self propelled gun sitting down there. And then he let us have it. Oh, boy. Set us on fire. Did you get hurt? We all got out. Good. And uh, one, of, one of the guys remembered there uh, was a, uh, extinguishers in the back, so he pulled them and when we, we didn't know what was going to fix it or not, but uh, we went back to the first compound there. And, uh, Germans in villages like that, uh, they had a, a common area where the houses were in a big circle like, and the barns and everything were in there the same way. They had big doors that they could close. And, uh, as we got near it, there was a telephone pole on each side of the other. And the tank was sitting down there, or whatever it was, at the gun. He shot at us, but he used an armor piercing shell, and he cut both telephone poles out <laughs> as we were oh. getting ready to win. Well, we went in just trying to find what was going on, and we found all the people down in the cellar. And um, they were scared to death, and there was no harmed us of any of good evening. So we went back out and the tank fire and stopped. So we decided to get back on and do what we intended to do. And they saw us. <laughs> they set it on fire again. Oh, just as we stranded up on it. But we got back down and uh, we couldn't stop the fire now. This shell was never really going off. So we decided to go on back and try and find the head, our headquarters. We went back to the village over to the light tanks and looked through them and uh, looked through three or four of them and we got in here, just the tank itself. And then we came to one and uh, the driver was hunched down in the tank. We thought he was dead. Then we went and we were going to get him out. And, we still have tested the ear may stuff. <laughs> uh, he was, well, scared. I don't know if he was scared of us too or what, but he wouldn't go with us. Huh. He was going to stay there and either get the caption <laughs> or what, and, huh. or they come up and get him. But he wouldn't go with us. So we decided to go back and we got some ways down the road. And our, Tank commander, he decided to, to go away with it. He wanted to go back to Paris and see what it was like. Try to talk us how to do it. And I was the only one that had any armor. I had any 45, I was the only one that had any guns. So uh, I told him, I said, well, nah. I said, you just go ahead and go. If you want to go, I'm not going to try to stop you. I said, but you're not going to pressure us. In the Gulf. And he said, Oh, he started your time. I had to drew my, drew my 45 on him. 
No kidding. So he finally decided not to go, and I gave my 45 to one of the guys to hold it. I know you're shouting. But uh, we finally got back to the company. And then uh, that was, uh, I think, the name of the town. Then Nuremberg was up there. We were going east. But then we switched and did a 100 mile drive in one day up to Port Patagon. That's as far as we could go on two tanks of gas. And we took a two gallon of fuel to go one mile mm. in the tank. And we could only go, well, 27 mile an hour was the highest we could run. So we did, all the tanks got up to outside of Patagon. But that was the evening then. So they said they'd wait before they made any assault. The uh, next morning, we uh, got up and they refueled. We had uh, trucks come up and we refueled. And we said, well, let's start out. Well, our tank wouldn't start. Hmm. And the uh, company commander didn't believe it. He was us all out of the tank. And he told his driver, get in there and start it for us. He couldn't start it either. <laughs> and I don't know what was wrong with it, but uh, they said, well, they're going to have to... Maybe three minutes left. Three minutes? Oh, 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 oh I can't even get into the song. Well, anyway, uh, Paderborn, uh, they had a road that went along, but uh, it was raised up the road, drop off on each side. Oh, we got all, they got all of our tanks on that road, and uh, the, they were ambushed. People were down there, and they had Panzer Faust that knocked them out, the front and back one first, so we couldn't move, and they had the other infantry troops there and shooting the guys as they came out. Oh, boy. Uh, uh, and uh, they come back and got us, and they had one tank there that uh, hadn't uh, ever came back, something or other. And they, but they needed a tank man. Our tank commander volunteered to go. And he went up there to see what was going on. And, and he got shot out by a tiger tank up on the hill down on him, killed everybody in it. Oh, yeah. And then later on, they had asked for volunteers to go up and see about all the tanks. I was up the shape over there. So uh, four of us went up. And we had to go to a, a tribunal and swear that the, there were no living persons in the tanks or anything and stuff like that. But then we went to Dort House and then the, we didn't do anything there, but we had, there was a, a hill there and there were people going up the hill. And we started shooting at them and here they were uh, uh, workers. That was where they made the V1 and V2 rockets and they had the uh, side of the hill, they had a factory. Mm. But then they, uh, on the right, there was a, a building, and they had set it on fire. The Germans had left and set it on fire, and uh, people were digging out, trying to dig out, they were shooting them. But uh, we just found that out later. But uh, we didn't stay there, we had to go on. And, uh, well, to get to the saw, uh, that was the last time we assaulted them, the 24th of. Uh, April, I guess it was. Uh, yeah, that was the 24th of April. And uh, we uh, didn't have much resistance. We went in the 25th, and uh, we got in there. We were sitting on the side of the road, and somebody decided to go across the Yellow River. We found out later we weren't supposed to. But uh, our company went over and was driving down this road. And two of those pictures in that book were taken on the other side of the hill. And, uh, well, that's when we, we got the camera on the 25th, too. But uh, when we got over on the other side, we went three or four miles, and we heard a jeep coming along 
großen Herrn der Staat haben. Und wir fragen die Seite des Staaten. I don't know, it was a curl, I think we did that. Gee, he said, get your ass back over. <laughs> 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 well, I'm over here. <laughs> so we went back and uh, then uh, the 26th, they told us to head back to Frankfurt. And we on the May and the end of the war. Well, I'm afraid we're going to run out of tape here, Rupert. And then before we do, I want to thank you for taking the time to, to sit and tell your stories. You, you've got a, a, a great repertoire of stories there. I'm glad you shared well, it with I got <laughs> Well, um, I wish we had more tape. But thank you for your, your service mm -hmm. and for coming down here today and conducting the interview here at the Public Library.